Good afternoon, everybody. Apparently, apparently Switzerland, Switzerland neighbors have no respect for Swiss watches. That's why a uh, uh, previous large uh, meeting uh, started uh, late, and that's why we are starting late as well, because of that. Thank you all for being here. We are supposed to discuss, to, to look into the future. Not the very distant future, but the very proximate one. And to think what is going to happen uh, in the Arab world to the Arab countries. And for that, we have uh, five extremely well-established uh, speakers uh, for that. The future is made of a number of events we can predict. I can tell you that that part of the world is going to be affected by elections in Israel on March the 17th, or elections in Turkey in June. I can tell you that uh, there are also other expected events, like, for example, if the oil price remains below $60, that's 20% of what it was, to, it was like six months ago, it means that political money is going to flow in much smaller, much smaller uh, 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 figures to various conflicts. This we can predict. We can also predict that in the next few months, battles, open battles, are going to be waged, like the battles the alliance is waging against ISIS in Iraq and partly in, in, in Syria. This we can also predict. What we cannot predict are political events that have impact on the situation, but are to a certain extent unpredictable. Not to their realization, but to their timing. Of course, we all knew that, as we say in Arabic, ages are in the hands of God. We all knew that the king of Saudi Arabia was 94, but nobody knew that he will pass away now. And we also know that this is going to have an impact and that the passing away of other leaders in that part of the world can also have impact. So we have events we can predict, not necessarily their effect. We don't know who's going to win this or that election, but their realization and other events we need to get ready for. That is why we have people who have been in responsible position and can come back to responsible position, who are now in responsible position, as is the first one to address the issue. That is the Prime Minister of Morocco, Mr. Ben Kiran, who is now, I would say, an habitué of Davos. Mr. Ben Kiran, the floor is yours. How do you see the next year or two from your point of view? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أولا أترحم على جلالة الملك عبد الله شخص الطرفية ليس كملك خوي فقط ولكن كشخص مؤمن بالله. I'm sorry there is no translation but I will summarize for non-Arabic speaker because Mr. Ben Kiran is the only one who is going to speak in Arabic I'll summarize his statement at the end. Je suis devenu un habitué mais vous vous avez perdu l'habitude de traduire. Je vais traduire je vais traduire je vais traduire. ثانيا يعني ثقافتنا مبنية على التفاؤل وأنا متفائل إن شاء الله الرحمن الرحيم للمستقبل بطبيعة الحال الأمور ليست سهلة لا تبدو سهلة لكن إذا كل طرف فهم دور الطبيعي والحضاري الذي هو أن يساهم في أن يتقدم بلده تتقدم أمته وأعطينا اليد لبعضنا البعض إن شاء الله الرحمن الرحيم تكون الأمور يعني جيدة وأظن أنه نحن إن كنا جميعا أبناء ثقافة واحدة ونطلب كلام الله باستمرار لا نفقهه جيدا هنالك أمران في القرآن الكريم الأمر الأول بالتعاون على البر والتقوى والأمر الثاني بعدم التنازع نحن تركنا التعاون ذهبنا إلى التنازع وهذا ما نحاول أن نتجنبه في المغرب وهذا ما بحمد الله إلى حد الآن ترك المغرب يعني لنقول في العموم دولة الأمور فيها تسير بطريقة إيجابية 
Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Could you summarize rapidly? Or do you want me to do that? Okay. Well, he basically said that uh, uh, in the Quran, there are at least two, two instructions to human beings not to get into conflict and cooperate. And that uh, uh, we have been in the past few years doing the conflict side, but not so much cooperation. He believes that Morocco uh, is leading the way into establishing forms of cooperation uh, in the near future. This is a very quick summary. Uh, I am moving now to a country at war, we can say that, at war. Yes. <clears throat> and the former Prime Minister of Iraq, Yad Alawi, is going to sort of tell us how he sees the next 12, 18 months. So shall we speak in English or yeah, Arabic? Please do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, in fact, the transformation, we are in the middle of transformation now. Not only Iraq, but the region as a whole. And we don't know, we cannot predict precisely what will hap be happening in the, in the near future, let alone the distant future from now. I think we face uh, severe uh, variables, including now to, in, the, in the Arab world, uh, including, of course, bloodshed and turmoil, uh, foreign interventions, interferences. And we have at least a score of uh, states which have been dismantled and are uh, non-functional anymore, like Libya, like Yemen, like even Iraq to some extent, Syria, and so on. The Palestinian issue is still, uh, the, the peace process is still uh, uh, stalled. Nothing is happening to push the peace process forward. And this is one of the sources of problems in the, in the Islamic world, in the world, and in the Middle East. Uh, I believe the, the first and foremost important uh, part of what we have to do before we can think of the future is to secure the stability of the countries involved in the turmoil that uh, these countries are facing. Uh, <clears throat> Iraq is facing uh, sectarianism is facing extremism, as in Daesh, and is facing a problem of governance. Uh, we see, I see both Syria and Iraq uh, as one theater, really. ISIS is not separated, it's, it's all fixed, the, and now it's moving to other places in the region. And we have heard from our Libyan brothers that it's moving into Libya also. ISIS. Well, really, there is a very serious challenge. What will determine, to some extent, the future with a comfortable degree of certainty is what is going to happen now for these countries, especially in the wake of the death of the late King Abdullah, who was one of the uh, uh, stabilizing factors in the, in the, in the Middle East. Uh, our problem now is to face the most extreme, most dangerous thing, the bleeding condition that ISIS is causing. And uh, I, frankly speaking, I haven't seen a coherent strategy yet to face <laughs> ISIS. What we see is scattered uh, uh, measures to, to, uh, to attack this point or take care of that point. But a coherent strategy, neither on the regional level nor on the international level, nor even in Iraq itself. Uh, I know with the Kurds, are, they have a strategy. The parts of uh, institutions in Baghdad have a strategy and so on. But we don't have a coherent strategy where all... Uh, I think the, the missing point of what has happened, and we don't want to go into details, that facing ISIS depends on two themes, on and, and interwoven themes. The first is military, where we have to use the military capability, whether it's pulling intelligence, whether it's special forces, whether it's aerial bombardment, and so on. And then there is a political theme, which is most important. If you don't get the people together and to buy in to the political processes in these countries in question, then no matter what winning you can make on the military side, you will be a loser at the end of the day. 
I know I speak to many people in Mosul and Tikrit and Ambar, and, and they say, what if we fight Daesh, where, will we, where, where shall we end? Are we going to be accused of being Ba'athist again, or terrorist, or uh, how, how can we? Or are we going to be considered as second-class citizens in the country? But I think this is, <clears throat> this is where the uh, problem lies, is, is first of all, how we can get rid of ISIS, so at least we can uh, see the future more clearly. Uh, the future we believe in is that we need to have democratic states, united, uni unified states. We need uh, collaboration. We need uh, growth and stability. And stability does not, uh, will not be ensured unless there is security. <coughs> and this is the only thing we want to see in the future, including, of course, the resol uh, resolving the, the, the Israeli-Palestinian question. Uh, through the, uh, the negotiations and the peaceful process where the Palestinians will get their rights. So really to, to be precise and to forecast what is going to happen in Libya, for example, or what's happening in Iraq is very difficult. And uh, I, uh, frankly speaking, I think that we should be very clear that to win this war and to create stability and to get the uh, Libya again, and Yemen, and Iraq, and Syria, and so on, resolved, uh, it's very difficult, because the transformation is happening. We don't know where it's going to lead. We know there are many va variables uh, interacting. We know the international community is uh, more concerned about their own problems, and paying attention, rightly so. And we know that there are, in the, in the region, uh, a race to, to dominate the region between various regional players. Thank you. Dr. Iyad, we are certainly no prophet, but I am still a bit stuck and certainly in the public. From the very first communique on ISIS, the American government has said that it you added a sentence saying that it, the fight against ISIS is going to take a lot of time. And recently, General Dempsey, the chief of staff, said that it may take 30 years. This morning, both Kurdish and uh, Kurdish Iraqi and Iraqi officials were telling us that things are going in the right direction, that they are recapturing territory, that it is not going to take so much time. I think the public would like your opinion on that. I mean, how yeah. much time is it going? The victory is at the end of the road, inshallah. Well, I can inshallah. How, how much time is it going to take? But we can't depend on inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> really, if there is no action. And the, the problem I see, and I said it, and I say it in the government, of course, in, in Baghdad, and I was amazed by the statements that came this morning uh, of uh, exaggerating the, 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 what is happening. Progress. Uh, <clears throat> I can't lay a timetable for what and when, for a simple reason because we don't have a strategy, and Iraq does not possess a strategy. And there is no real uh, coordination and cooperation between Kurdistan and Baghdad on this issue. And the international alliance, which are involved in bombardments for the last three, three months or so, uh, have not achieved anything really, except preventing ISIS from moving and taking Erbil, and twice preventing ISIS from taking the periphery of Baghdad and coming to the center of Baghdad. My information that ISIS are now much more capable than they used to be. They are recruiting people. They are making use of the chaotic atmosphere that have been created. They are making use out of the militias that have been deployed in, uh, in Iraq. They are taking advantage of foreign fighters who are coming to the aid of the Iraqi government and to the, uh, to the Iraqis. And they are taking advantage of the portraying of the problem as a Sunni and Shi'i problem, which is not. It's a group of extremism who are trying to impose their will on the Iraqi people. But this is really uh, what's happening. I think we, with all my respect to our colleagues in the government, uh, we can't, uh, inshallah, inshallah, yes. But inshallah, if there is nothing, God says that, help yourself, so I'll help you. <laughs> Dr. Mahmoud, your role have been, has been crucial 
in the Libyan uh, sort of uh, upheaval against uh, Colonel Gaddafi three years ago. Then Libya was an extremely positive place, and full of optimism and everything. And somehow, at one point, it took the wrong turn. Uh, how do you see Libya and the neighborhood of Libya in the next 18 months? Well, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant of uh, predicting anything because when I predicted by late 2011 what's taking place in Libya right now, I was accused of being pessimistic and that I am uh, always look at the black side, you know, uh, and the empty side of the glass. Uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, if things continue the way they are in the region, the way we deal with the current situation, things are going to get worse. And here's my reasons, you know. First, I think the structural problems which exist in the region are still there. There is a lack of alignment. This is the first gap between the national economies of the Arab world and the global economy. Rarely, if you find any national economy in the Arab world which did what we call in the visioning exercise, positioning that economy within the context of the global economy. You do the positioning to discover the competitive edge where you can mobilize your national resources around it. Those resources, whether natural resources or human resources, then you start aligning the subsystems with this national economy, whether it's the political system, allow for more participation, whether it's the social system, you deal with the values that hinder the participation and the work value, whether it's the ed cultural, which is the most important, the education, it has nothing to do with the 21st century. So we employ in our governments out of fear that those kids might run to the streets. Not we employ because the economy is growing and the new vacancies are available you know, to assimilate more. Even if the economy is competitive enough, you will not find that the subsystems, the education has nothing to do with the needs of the economy. Our culture, our values, you ha they have nothing to do with uh, what's needed for the national economy to, to be competitive. So these are two holes between the subsystems and the national economy, and between the national economy and the global economy. Then there is those who are coming out because they've been marginalized. They didn't find jobs. They became extremists. And they continue to be extremists because we are moving in the same vicious circle, you know. We are reinforcing this vicious circle. More hundreds of thousands of young people are coming to the market. They don't find jobs. So they find Daesh, they find Al-Qaeda, which they offer lucrative offers, good salaries, they offer paradise, and they offer even Jihad al nikah So you name it, it's there, you know. And you it's cannot paradise beat. on earth. Yes, it, it, you cannot beat this offer. While the government or the system does not offer the same thing. Therefore, I think the vicious circle is going to continue. What we need is to deconstruct and reconstruct the socialization process. You need a new Arab mind to be compatible with the future. You need a new Arab mind to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. I'm afraid to say that the future is on the side of extremism. Why is that? If you look at Daesh, for instance, first, the structure of Asian Daesh today is between 15 and 25 years old. While it was in Al-Qaeda during the late 70s and 80s, it was from 25 to 35 years old. More professionals are coming to Daesh because it became fashionable, Daesh. Not only this, they are very skillful in technology. So technology is serving them better. The age bracket is serving them better while the Arab systems are dealing the same way. Are we going to witness the end of uh, Arab uprising? No, as long as those uh, holes in the, in the structures of the Arab world are there, whether in our cultural systems and our economic systems, lack of alignment between all those systems. 
I think the uprising will continue to happen and extreme, extremism is going to continue to happen. For the Arab regimes, they have to realize that there is a new name for legitimacy, more inclusion and development. The real security for any regime today is development. The real legitimacy for any regime is to embrace its people, to include them, not to exclude them. Thank you. Amr Bey, as an Egyptian and as a former Secretary General of the Arab League, you have many reasons to look into the future and to ask yourself what kind of elections you are going to have in Egypt in two months from now. Is the donor uh, meeting going to be successful because Egypt needs external financial support? And more generally, how do you see the Arab world evolving in the next 18 to 24 months? Well, thank you, Hassan. The, uh, in fact, I wanted to speak in Arabic like the Prime Minister. And all of us tried, but we were told by the organizers that there's only one exception. It will be uh, given to the Prime Minister, so we'll have to speak in English. Starting also with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <laughs> uh, the elements or the salient points that you uh, mentioned as the basic points for our discussion, you mentioned two things. Number one, the Israeli elections, and two, the oil prices. Well, I don't believe that the Israeli elections do matter for the Middle East. Change in the Israeli policy is what matters. What would influence, affects the future of the region. But changing one prime minister with the other, it is of no relevance to the issue or the, the subject you are discussing. Number two, the oil prices. Some analysts, I believe that it is like a curse. There will be a shortage of money and uh, less capability to assist and so on. The other side of the coin is that it could be really a positive change because it will behoove the governments to act on real, correct economic basis to produce, to develop the economy, and to be serious about developing their state of life. Number three, the revolutions that have taken place, starting with Tunisia, Egypt, etc., have changed the public opinion in the Arab world in its entirety. People now know that they can protest and they can change their regimes. It happened twice in Egypt, it happens in Tunisia, and it will be the order of the day for so many years to come. The change is that it is not easy now to tell the people we are going to have elections or we are going to do this or that. And the ruler expects that the usual, yes sir, or they will not really pay attention. No, it is under scrutiny by all the people now what the government did, what kind of elections, and why now, and why not tomorrow, and why not yesterday? The public opinion in the Arab world started to play a decisive role, and this will determine the future. The public opinion is taking advantage of the new advances in technology. Not only the, the internet and, and uh, the social uh, connections, but the freedom of thought and expression that you see in so many TV stations, in French, in Arabic, in English, etc. So anybody can listen to what happened in France, what happened in Washington, what did Mr. Obama said yesterday, and why did he uh, say that, and the, 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 the basic point he advanced about the economy of the middle class. This will resonate all over resonate in the universities, our universities, with our professors of economy, with our policy makers on economy and so on. The Arab world is changing. The youth, young people, who now compose for over 60% of all our population from Morocco to Oman, from Mauritania to Oman. It is a change in the, the, the not only the age bracket, but the way people think. 
and they drive behind an opinion or behind a certain request or a certain demand. The, now, for example, in Egypt, women, the Constitution has stipulated that 25% of all local governments, parliaments, councils will have to be women. If the elections or the government appointed, uh, 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 policy of appointment does not reach this 25%, it is unconstitutional. See? So there is a, a comeback or a, a real overture for women and their role in the, uh, in the political life. This is very important. It will bring change. It will bring new brains and new attitudes and new reactions. Also, the good governors. I happen to believe that the reason behind the revolutions in the Arab world, the main reason is the bad governance and the cumulative effect of the bad governance. I can say that about Egypt. Certainly there was bad governance that has led to the anger, the frustration that the people felt and the 25th of January 2011 was no question the result of such a frustration and anger because of the bad governance. Not only in economy or in social policies or in security policies or in geopolitics, the whole thing was wrong. It was one man's decision. This will not come back to the Arab world. It will be because people want to say that we have, we are, have the right to decide our future. You cannot have just one person decides for you. He has to consult. He has to put things before the public opinion. And here I wish to pay tribute to the king of Morocco because he started this uh, uh, practice and therefore uh, pushed uh, the, the, any uh, feeling of frustration or anger of revolution. This is the way we want, but not only this. We have to move uh, uh, into a different, uh, more open government. Democracy, in my opinion, will be the order of the day. The public opinion will not accept dictatorship anymore. Not that this will happen tomorrow, but this is a process, and the process has started. That is why I am optimistic about the future of the Arab world. Linked to all that, as we were discussing, the, the new order in the Arab world and in the Middle East, I mean, West Asia and, 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 and North Africa, uh, we will have to discuss a new order and to form one all of us. Uh, the old order will not work, cannot serve the, the purpose of, uh, of the future Middle East. Thank you, Amr. Dr. Arif, you have many reasons to be among us this afternoon. One of them that you are also Libyan and interested in the future of Libya, but also that you have been an extremely uh, well uh, sort of traveled observer of political Islam and of Islamic movement in this region. And you were the one who yesterday was telling us that ISIS has established strongholds in your country, in Libya. And you mentioned five places where ISIS, so it's no more just Mosul or Raqqa, it's also North Africa as well. And uh, how do you see this is going? I mean, the, 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 the sort of flat idea is that we are faced with either the barracks or the mosque and that we have to choose between the two. Are you of this line or do you think there is a possibility of other alternatives? Bismillah rahman rahim <clears throat> First of all, I would like to express my heartfelt uh, condolences to the people of Saudi Arabia and the Arab world uh, for the passing away of a great king, King Abdullah. And also to just make a quick comment about monarchies and their stabilizing role. Unfortunately, in 1969, we lost our monarch, uh, King Idris, rahmatullahi alayhi, through a coup, an army coup. And uh, unfortunately, we've suffered the consequences for 42 years or more. As a matter of fact, uh, we are st still struggling to even draft a constitution when we had a, a perfectly nice constitution going back to the 1950s. Uh, but be that as it may, um, we now have a rise of something quite sinister, which we call ISIS or Daesh. And I believe that 
it's very important not to see this phenomenon as unique to the Arab world. And uh, part of the way to expand our horizons is to look into history and the history of, of many uh, civilizations, including the European one. I believe ISIS is nothing else, uh, uh, nothing other than uh, Islamized fascism, basically, or fascism painted with the paint of Islam. I believe that the uh, period we're passing through in history in the Arab world is very similar to the period Europe was passing through towards the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And the same dark forces that led to the rise of fascism in Italy and Spain and, and in Germany are now leading to the rise of a, 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 an Islamically painted fascism, which is ISIS. It is no coincidence that the mass executions, the tortures, the degradation of the human being, the hallmarks of fascism are all present in the ISIS phenomenon. So I think it's very important not to see this as an Islamic thing or an Islam thing. I think it is more to do with the will to power. And I think it, the will to power becomes more acute as people feel scared and threatened. I believe that what is happening in our region is, is a reaction to the loss of meaning in many ways. And the failure of many of our traditional institutions, especially the relig religious ones and the cultural ones, to actually not only preserve themselves, but to actually revive themselves and, the, and renew themselves so as to give meaningful frameworks for young people. I believe that, I believe that it's a cultural and, and uh, spiritual crisis that's generating uh, uh, this, this nihilism. And uh, ISIS is, is, is simply an ideology of nihility, of nothingness, of, of death uh, affirming rather than life affirming. While Islam, as in Christianity, as in Buddhism, as in Judaism, as in all the great faiths of the world, uh, is a life affirming uh, culture. Uh, unfortunately, our institutions that used to affirm life and to celebrate life and to spread ideas of compassion and peace and understanding and forgiveness and humility uh, are giving way to, to a, a nothingness. And ISIS basically lives on this nothingness and promotes this nothingness. And that's why I believe that the easiest thing we can do, and it's the worst thing that we can do, is to sink into despair or depression or cynicism about this whole thing. I believe that there is much to be uh, hopeful about. Uh, there are intrinsic um, modes of resilience within the Arab world that are extremely important. Um, I believe the, the caring uh, of, of Arab women uh, is an extremely important uh, form of resilience. Libyan women met last week. They met a, a couple of, uh, a few weeks ago also. They met last week in Tunisia and before that in, 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 in uh, Egypt. And their, their discourse is amazingly life affirming, amazingly uh, peace-focused, compassion-focused, dialogue-focused. We need to listen to these voices who were an integral part of this uh, Arab Spring, but who unfortunately got suffocated as soon as the Arab Spring was successful by fascist movements that basically deprived them of that voice. There is resilience in our young people. It is not the case that all young uh, uh, Arabs are, are uh, prone to ISIS. It's, a, it's still, with the vast numbers that are joining ISIS, it's still a tiny minority of Arab youth. Arab youth do not accept this. They want to reject this, but they're looking uh, to their adults uh, in the society and they're not finding meaningful discourse. The religious scholars are ma making no sense. The preaching is not reaching the hearts. The, the, reverend, uh, the, the revered institutions of the past are just uh, peddling cliches. We need to renew our culture. We need to renew our, our, our discourse and give these young people meaning and the first thing we, we should do to give the meaning is to listen to them. This is a second form of resilience that we need to invoke. A third one, which is extremely important, is to respect locality. You know, the, the state uh, that tries to plan from above and impose its will is another form of fascism. It is also a will to power. We need to listen to the locality, be it a municipality or a township or a clan or a tribe. We need to respect these local forces, the social fabric, and initiate a true genuine dialogue at the social fabric level that can lead to a consensus that can give us constitutions on which we can uh, have states that are, that are healthy uh, being built. So um, we, need, we need to invoke all these things and, and we need to most importantly stay hopeful, stay positive and create networks of goodness and compassion. And that's why we are part of this network of, at Davos. You can only fight networks of darkness with, with networks of understanding, appreciation, and mutual respect. And thank you. Thank you, Arif. I will take a...
I will take a, a first round, a first round of questions from the public now. With the lady to start with, Hi. present yourself and ask your question as uh, summarized as possible. Um, I'm Sara Alawi. I actually have a question for Dr. Ayad Alawi. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not an easy one either. Don't you dare to ask it at home. <laughs> this is woman rights. <laughs> um, you said in other words that efforts to strengthen the army and even international bomba bombardments of ISIS alone will not, um, overcome I will not overcome ISIS. You're part of the Iraqi, without a strategy, of course. You're part of the Iraqi government. Why is there no strategy? Thank you, Zanahi. What he was saying, I'm sure it's music to the ears of a lot of people who are sitting here, especially the liberals. Uh, I'm not one, but I'm sure the liberals are very happy with what he was saying, because that is the cause of the problems that we have today. Nobody's, I mean, we talk about ISIS here, but nobody's talking why ISIS started. So a lot of what Mahmoud Jibril was saying is creating ISIS. Now, since Mr. or Dr. Salama's words were at the beginning, let's look into the next 12 to 18 months. Let's not look ahead of that, but for the next 12 to 18 months, which we cannot be as optimistic as uh, His Excellency Amr Musa for the next 18 months, where do you see, Mr. Mahmoud Jibril, how are we going to fix the issues that you raise, the issue of inclusiveness? Do you see it's going to happen anywhere in the Arab world? That's number one. Number two, do you see this business of cultural shock to get us to the next level in order that we understand and we accept each other, rather than a wise man was telling us the other night that you abuse somebody with color, then you are racist. You abuse somebody who's Jewish, you're anti-Semitic. You abuse somebody who's a Muslim or Islam, then it's freedom of speech, which is, sorry, even to say it is unacceptable because that is a defeatism from then. So that's Mahmoud Jibril. Well, I take these two questions to start with. Dr. Iyad and then Dr. Mahmoud. Well, the reason for not having a strategy is really embedded in uh, the the problem between the, the, uh, the allies, the international uh, alliance, and the way how they see things as far as fighting ISIS, and between uh, the regional uh, vision of what kind of uh, strategy is needed. And Iraq is lost between those two conflicts because Iraq does not have the means to defend itself. The army was uh, dismantled when the invasion took place and when occupation took place. And as we are building the army again, we don't have weapons. We don't have enough ammunitions. We don't have weapons. We don't have trained uh, army. The army that we retrieved, unfortunately, suffered a lot of setbacks. And this is where we need the help of uh, foreign uh, countries and alliances who say that they are against ISIS. That's why uh, no strategy has been developed. And uh, indeed, uh, when I speak about the, the political side, it is important to realize that the only ideology that's, which is binding people now is the Islamic ideology, the Isla Islamization, which is, which is, uh, which is have t been taken out of context, and Islam has been hijacked, and a group are claiming under the ideology of Islam because the, uh, the, the, the ideologies that prevailed over the last two centuries have, uh, have not produced anything except chaos and, uh, and bad management. Uh, the, the, that's why this, it's very difficult to have a, a real uh, strategy to fight ISIS. Before going to Dr. Jabril, I would like to go back to you, Mr. Ben Kiran. You somehow represent in Morocco, uh, what should I say? a softer form of political Islam than the one we are discussing here. What is your view of uh, how religion is going to mix with politics and how it can mix positively and how it unfortunately sometimes mix explosively? Look, <laughs> ثلاث تيارات تتجاذب العالم العربي تيار يريد التحكم وأن تبقى الأمور تقريبا كما كانت تيار متشدد 
يريد أن يعود بنا إلى مرحلة خلاص لا يمكن أن تعود عليها البشرية إطلاقا وتيار ديمقراطي يريد أن يأخذ بعين الاعتبار بطريقة معتدلة معطيات الواقع So the Arab world is sort of torn between three different political currents The first one wants the sort of the status quo to remain as is The second one wants to bring the Arab world back to centuries which is absolutely realistic and the third one is democratic trend لا, لا مستقبل للمنطقة العربية إلا في الاختيار الوسط لكن الاختيار الوسط يحارب من الاختيار الأول والاختيار الثاني There is no future but for the centrist line but the centrist line is being fought by the two sides by those who want to go back to past centuries and for those who want the status quo to remain كما قال الأخ جبريل من قبل حين التحكم يمسك الأمور تكون يعني المطالب غير مستجاب لها مشاعر غير مستجاب لها يأتي التشدد ويرد على التحكم وحين يصبح التشدد هو الذي يهيمن نعود إلى صور يعني مرعبة من التصرفات التي لا يمكن أن يقبلها لا دين ولا منطق خصوصا في هذه المرحلة التي نحن فيها التيار المعتدل هو أمل كل من اليوم يوجد في الساحة ويمسك السلطة لأنه هو الذي يمكن أن يدخل معه الآخرين لا على المستوى الاقتصادي الأقوياء دائما يأخذون حقهم الذين كانوا قادرين على إزعاجهم أخذوا حقهم الآن بقية بقي الشعوب يعني الطبقات التي لم تصل لا بد من إدخالها الطبقات التي لم يعترف بها سياسيا ولم يعترف بها على مستوى أفكاره وأرائه لا بد من إدخالها لا بد أن نتصالح مع أنفسنا إذا تصالحنا مع أنفسنا طيار التحكم سيرجع إلى حدوده والتشدد كما كان دائما سوف يبقى ولكن سوف يصبح مهمشا والعالم ساعتها سيكون لنا مكانة فيه تفرض عليه أن يأخذ بعين الاعتبار مواقفنا وساعتها يمكن الانتخابات الإسرائيلية تأخذنا بعين الاعتبار أما لحد الآن ما تأخذنا بعين الاعتبار Well basically what Mr. Ben Kiran is saying is that authoritarianism and extremism are mutually supportive and basically they try to sort of alternate in power between themselves but there are other social classes, the people, he says, who are not represented yet and can only be represented by a moderate line. And moderate line can represent these people and speak and speak for them. بقية نقطة واحدة بسيطة. تفضل. الذين يعني ينطلقون من المرجعية الإسلامية. هؤلاء يجب أن يفهموا أن دورهم أن يساعدوا بلدانهم على أن تتقدم. إذا فقط كانوا سوف يرجعونها إلى الأزمات ما ينفعون. Now, a uh, last word for those who sort of take Islam as their reference. If they only want to sort of impose on the rest of the society their views, they are not going anywhere. They need to serve their people and not only to impose. المطالبة بالحق التي تكون نتيجتها زيادة المشاكل على الأمة وهذه لا في النهاية لا الناس ينظرون إلى المقاصد ما الذي يحصل حقيقة ممكن تكون إسلامي لكن إذا كنت ستخرب الدنيا ماذا سنفعل بك؟ An Islamist is as accountable as anybody else and therefore it is by what happens uh, when Islam comes to power that people that these guys will be judged not by what they say in public. Now, Mr. Jibril, you had a question from Mr. Janahi. I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, deal with three levels of, uh, of analysis and responding to his question. Uh, the first level is that uh, what uh, Mr. Ben Kiran told, uh, told us just now, the democratic nationalist stream of thought in the Arab world, you know. Unfortunately, this is a reactive movement, you know the elites in the Arab world, especially who advocating democracy, they are reacting, but they did not offer any alternative to those extremist movements. I can draw the attention here, uh, or the comparison between two cases. During the 19th century, there was an awakening movement where Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, Muhammad Abdu took place, you know. It was intellectual movement. They had a model but there was no action in the street. It came years later. What happened in the Arab uprising now is exactly the opposite. People came to the street, but without any intellectual frame. There was no model, there was no dream that they go for. So when the regimes fell down, everybody was claiming legitimacy. 
Everybody was claiming the monopoly of that uh, revolution, of that uprising. And everybody is, is claiming credit for uh, bringing the regime down. And this is a problem. The door or the role of the elite who are talking about democracy or talking about national aspiration is to develop a model, to develop a dream for those young people. Otherwise, it would be just an empty shot in the air. This is the first level. If we come down to the Libyan case, I would say there are also two levels. The first level is how to stop the bleeding. I would go, a national dialogue is needed. But a national dialogue that should consider and recognize that there is a huge gap of mistrust between the Libyans, that we should deal with it. Two, that there is no exclusion for anybody, anybody who accepts a civil state, who doesn't resort to violence, you know, to express his, his uh, political desires, political objects, should be included in this national dialogue. Libya is for all and should be built by all Libyans. This number two. In terms of concrete actions, we should start right away a decentralized government where municipalities should start providing services for the people. The economy should be reactivated again in all those cities. We have only about five Libyan cities which is full of arms and full of militias. But the rest of the Libyan cities are totally safe. There is no excuse for any Libyan government to wait till this problem is solved. Why don't we restart the rebuilding the state from the periphery instead of uh, focusing on the center. This will start giving a hope for those young people. New jobs are created. Even those who accumulated lots of wealth during the last four years, there will be an opportunity for their money to be invested in different economic projects. Therefore, this does not exclude the strategic path where a new educational system is needed, a new look at our religion where man is mandated by God to be creator on this earth should be also reactivated. Mosques have a new role to play. I mean, this is what I call a real cultural revolution that's needed to create. My God, uh, terrorism became a job. It's not an activity anymore. And this is the problem. You know. Thank you. Uh, we still have five minutes. I would like to give the floor later to Prime Minister Mikati, who's, uh, who's here with us. But I can't have this meeting end without saying a word about the largest humanitarian disaster the 20th century has known, that is Syria. I mean, 200, at least 200,000 people have been killed already, and we didn't mention the word Syria. Uh, I recognize in the room the special representative of the United Nations, and I would like at least Amr and Dr. Iyad in one shot to tell him, to give him their advice. What is better done to sort of alleviate the tragedy, the Syrian tragedy. Amr. Well, the situation in Syria is so complicated. And I don't think uh, a separate approach uh, would do because of the accumulation of number of the uh, refugees displaced and so on. Uh, now is the, the, the worst moment for them in winter. And I'm sure that the UN has done all it can. The Arab countries have done all they can, but we all fell short of dealing with it properly, with this problem properly. And as uh, Prime Minister Makati is here, I have to make a special mention of Lebanon and what Lebanon has done and what Lebanon has uh, uh, hosted, a uh, big number uh, for them. Uh, but uh, the... We have to do more, and the political solution for Syria will have to be worked for, and for big countries, permanent members, will have to abandon the policy of managing crisis. They have to address the crisis. They are, as we have seen in Palestine and many other uh, problems, there is a problem, difficult to solve, so it is better to manage and keep uh, going here and there. So I hope that the special representative, who is an old hand in all those issues, will take into consideration the point that managing the crisis is against basic rights and will add to the problem of refugees and displaced. Prime Minister Mikati. Uh, this Salame question 
just I would like that you clarify. Is this, it is the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, what they are doing in Libya? Uh, well, it is. So it's becoming a generic name. Yes. yes. What's the re reason of existing such generic name today in Arab society? That's another question that we have to elaborate, I guess. So it's not anymore Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Mm. Mm. It is becoming a, trans, a, a trans, movement mm -hmm. in this Islamic State. Transregional. Last word to Dr. Iyad, possibly to address this question well, I, by I Mr. Think, Mikati. Uh, I think the, if we count the displaced and the refugees and uh, those who are unfortunately being killed, the numbers mount to millions of people, not only uh, 200,000 or uh, are around this figure. And really, I cannot see any way but for the international community and the regional community to help as much as they can uh, and to resolve the, the problems as quick as possible. We cannot wait for uh, people to decide at leisure what to do and what to have. And uh, otherwise, every day passing, we are losing people. And people are getting displaced and getting re uh, to seeking refugees and uh, status in different countries. For the situation, and this is, by the way, this is when you look at Lebanon or you look at uh, Jordan, Jordan, quarter of the population now is from Syria. One million. We have in Iraq, inside Iraq, only this place is uh, two, two millions. But that's why it's very difficult, and I, I think the, U, the UN is uh, aware of, 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 of these enormous problems. But I don't think they have a solution for this issue. Thank you all on this not very positive note, but still realistic one. Thank you all for being with us.